mighty beautiful flower arrangement. And we thank the good people that make this possible. Not long ago, someone described conscience as a small, weak voice that is getting smaller and weaker every day. And while this probably isn't exactly true, there are symptoms in society that would indicate that the internal values of the individual are not available to him as often as we would wish. What is conscience? There have been many, many different definitions. One definition that perhaps, perhaps has some validity is that conscience is the voice of the folk. That is, it is a kind of whisper that descends to us through generation after generation of human experience. It is based upon the evidence of the past. It is based upon a careful consideration of the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. It is involved in man's total experience of existence. We see around us every day the consequences of wrong action. We observe how our neighbors suffer, how our nations are disturbed, and how our world is troubled. And we begin to put together patterns we see the causes behind the difficulties that arise. We observe the temperament of our neighbor and decide that to some degree at least, this neighbor has been responsible for the sorrows that have come to him. We find the collective tragedy of disobedience to the common laws of our kind. We recognize the dangers of crime and of violence. We begin to appreciate the increasing problem of alcoholism and narcotics addiction. And we are able to see enough of the consequences of mistakes to create within ourselves a certain subconscious desire to correct these conditions so far as they apply to ourselves. And we are very apt to legislate in the direction of the correction of the common mistakes of living. Conscience, therefore, can be the voice of the old and the voice of the true, and to a sense at least the voice of the new. It is this continual nagging within ourselves against the intemperances which we realize to be dangerous. This type of folk experience comes down to us through history, through biography, uh, through the testimonies of contemporary people, and through the personal experiences that come to ourselves every day. We know that if we do not discipline ourselves, we will fall into bad habits. We know that we allow, if we allow our appetites and our emotions to dominate our conduct, we will likely get into difficulties. So this has become a kind of internal defense mechanism. It is something that has come to us through the five sensory perceptions, has been reorganized and reintegrated in the brain, and has gradually been transferred to the heart as the basis of good living. This perhaps is an oversimplification of this problem, but it certainly does play a part. Conscience is just a series of warnings not to do what others have done and suffered as a consequence. Another uh, definition of conscience, uh, as we get a little more theological, is that in a sense it is the voice of the divine part of ourselves. Somewhere in the root of each living thing will be found the seal of the laws governing life. Every living thing, whether it be animate or inanimate, wishes to survive. And the seed of survival and the concepts necessary to survival seem to have descended to us with the very bodies and minds that we have inherited. 
Conscience is therefore that power within man which controls his moral growth, very much as that power in nature which controls the conduct of all other creatures. Just as the plant seeks the light, just as the earth is fruitful, so there are instincts to survive, to grow, to unfold and fulfill. And these instincts are born in us. They are part of our heritage. They are part of the life force which animates us. For with this force comes also certain impulses as to how this force is to be used. The proper use of all energy is survival. The lack of this proper use is self-destructive. So if we wish to assume that every ray of light brings life and hope to living things, so this same ray of light may have within itself the laws guiding its own use and aiming at survival by the correction of all abuse that may arise anywhere in the individual or collective destiny. If in truth this principle of survival is in us, it has laws, it has rules, it has systems of its own. Survival is not an accident. It is not some manifestation of a capricious providence. Survival is the result of the obedience of the principles to which survival is associated. Therefore, the will to be happy, the desire to be healthy, the hope for peace and harmony, the uh, intention uh, to do those things which will secure the maximum benefits, these impulses seem to be innate. They are probably in every cell and every blood drop that makes up the human corporeal constitution. They are in everything that exists because existence continues, unfolds, and survives according to rules. It is not a series of accidents. In an effort to cooperate with the laws of existence, men attained or sought to attain some knowledge of these laws. And all the history of the search for realities has been impelled by this belief that the search will end in security, that the various factors and forces that make up destiny can be and are influenced by conduct, and that conduct itself is the secret of man's securities and happiness. This would carry the idea that there is a certain conscience in nature, that every natural law and natural force has something to do with the principle of cause and effect. And the principle of cause and effect tells us and reveals to us that unless we set up the proper causations, we cannot expect the securities we hope. Now the search for the rules has dominated us for thousands of years. And the wisest and noblest of human beings have been dedicated to an effort to discover the rules governing life and the development of a character within living things by which these rules will be obeyed. That obedience to rules becomes the most important law for man. This, of course, naturally leads us to another problem. If there be rules, who made them? What is the source of these laws? Are they something that is innate in matter? Are they something that, is, that in themselves are eternal? Had they no beginning? Is there no intelligent principle behind them? Is it simply a series of accommodations to the unknown? Don't many thoughtful persons do not accept this. They do not believe that there can be laws without a lawmaker. They do not believe there can be an orderly existence unless the source of that existence is also orderly. And it has occurred to a great many who have studied human behavior that unless there are rules, there will be chaos. 
The individual without some pattern to live by seldom lives well. In the same way, a universe that has no pattern for its own existence can become involved in innumerable catastrophes. And it is the opinion of many learned persons who have studied the universe in some detail that without a presiding genius, without a sovereign principle or law, we would not even be problem today because we would no longer exist. We would have perished long ago in the combustion of stars and the collisions of planets. We would have had no orderly defense for our needs or for our the joys and sorrows. We realize that there is a strange interlocking of principles and processes all through the universe, and that these in turn are all aimed at providing a reasonable pattern for the existence of existing things. Buddha declared the universe to be a vast commonwealth. It was a vast integration, a kind of strange socialized cosmos in which all of the principles work together for the common good, and all of these principles are subjectively aware of what constitutes the common good. Thus it would follow that, as Lord Bacon pointed out, that we cannot hope to have a mentally integrated universe without a mind. We cannot have life without universal life. We cannot have thought without universal thought behind it. We cannot have actions unless these are made possible through the dynamics in the universal pattern itself. So this brings with it the concept that conscience is something bestowed with natural law, that it is the true explanation of order, that it is the principle by which we exist as long as we obey, and obedience, in this case, is conformity to a universal purpose. At the seat of this universal purpose is, therefore, the universal purpose maker. The universe is either purposed or it is not purposed. If it is not purposed, nothing is important. If it is purposed, everything is important. As we obviously note every day, things are important. Therefore, the power that creates them must have importance, must have significance, must have the power and the authority to enforce the patterns by which the universe exists. We also come to know, gradually, that this universe is much more complicated and far vaster than we have ever imagined. It goes out into infinitudes of light years. It is inhabited by worlds, races, and nations of stars. It is constantly in motion. It is constantly emo evolving or manifesting. Every motion and manifestation is orderly. And every process is so exact that man has been unable to discover actually any conflict in this great pattern of things. What we call conflict, we are beginning to realize, is simply form of order and law which we do not comprehend, that is beyond our immediate or proximate knowledge. So the second theory of conscience is based upon the fact that it is based upon an allegiance of the individual form of life to the parent form, to the causal form, to the laws and rules governing the entire and that the individual, as part of an entirety far vaster than himself, cannot set up an independent pattern of life in a world that is controlled by an absolute law. Conscience, then, can be said to be con constantly counseling us to obey the principles upon which survival depends. Conscious, conscience is the internal recognition of a universal plan of a divine power at the source of that life, and a divine edict to which we must give allegiance whether we wish to or not. This <clears throat> brings into the pattern the problem of deity. Today there are many athe atheistic states and nations. 
There are a great many, probably, private atheists. But the total body of mankind is overwhelmingly, internally motivated by spiritual or psychical forces. The individual, by experience, cannot find the universe of the atheist. He finds that a little knowledge inclineth his mind to atheism, but greatness of knowledge bringeth it back again to God. The more we know about the universe, the fewer atheists we will have. It is ignorance of principles that makes atheism possible. It is the fact that we have not gone far enough into the realities to outgrow the illusions which have arisen in our own minds. So to create a conscience-governed universe, we must have a universal conscience. This conscience is revealed to us largely through scriptural writings in which deity, in one form or another, through its prophets, through its saints and sages, is made to proclaim its own purposes to make manifest its will and bestow upon mankind the laws suitable for the survival and fulfillment of the divine plan. This constitutes, of course, another problem for many thinkers. It is possible to some that there may be a universal mind that is not necessarily identical with a deity as we understand God today. The universal mind may be inherent. The laws may be actually eternal in the substances uh, by which they manifest themselves. This could be true of certain things, but it brings in certain other conflicts which we are not able to understand. Among mortals, wherever mind exists, conflict exists. The intellect is competitive. The intellect is forever imposing itself upon other intellects. It is constantly challenging other aspects of itself. In the large pattern of things, there is very little conformity in mental processes. Specialization has resulted in the mind being trained to be competitive. It has been trained to compare and to find many odious comparisons. It has been trained to search for differences and to distinguish things by their separateness. Therefore, the mind by itself has never been able to prove that it could maintain a universal purpose any more than it can be proved that mentality, as it has evolved among human beings, has resulted in a final brotherhood of man. Mentality has caused more division than any other factor that we know. Mentality on a cosmic level, therefore, might be implied as causing divisions. Things by mentality may be created, but this creative process ends in conflict, one form of life in constant conflict with another. Now, while this condition is notable and inevitable on a material level, where mind is involved in various degrees of form, it is inconceivable that the conflict of mind could regulate the cosmos. It would then set one cosmos against another, and Star Wars would be a reality. As a matter of fact, however, such wars in space are not known to really exist. And the moment we get above a certain level of intellection, the whole concept of war collapses. The more the mind meditates upon realities, the less conflict there is. But unfortunately, most minds do not meditate that deeply. And the result is the world is in confusion so far as human governments are concerned. But there is no evidence that this confusion extends into the universe. We find, therefore, that most of the troubles of humanity arise with humanity. And most of these troubles arise in the effort of the individual to play deity on some level of function for which he is not qualified. Thus we have another point in, of view in connection with conscience. That conscience is something inside of man 
that is constantly affirming the importance of obedience to the grand plan of things, a conscience that goes far beyond the simple brotherhood of man, but includes it, a conscience that goes on to a brotherhood of worlds, a, a brotherhood of galaxies, in which everything that exists is there for a purpose and is in relationship to everything else that exists. Now, in more recent years, we have had a psychological approach to the problem of conscience. And this psychological approach is a kind of compromise. It has to do with the fact that conscience is the consequence of the various conflicts within personality itself. That the individual's conscience is born of his own neuroses born of his own introversions and extroversions, born of his own acceptances and rejections, and that therefore conscience is completely and entirely personal, and what one person does with a good conscience would afflict the conscience of another person. This again has some interesting factors involved in it, but we cannot take it uh, as a final uh, statement of our subject. Assuming that conscience is the result of what has happened to us and how we have reacted to it, it would, approve, it would seem very obvious that because our actions are equated by our minds and experienced by our emotions, that conscience would then simply be the voice of our own total psychic experience. It would have no definite relationship to the experience of any other person. Each may have a conscience of this kind, but this conscience originates in the complex of his own nature. It results from his own attitudes toward things. Conscience, therefore, seems to be able to impel one person to a crime of vengeance because he believes his cause is just. Another individual with a different integration under a similar provocation decides that conscience is telling him to forgive his enemy and to continue to do good to those who grievously afflict him. Each person trying to fulfill his own conscience may cause this conscience to appear to be himself. And under this uh, pressure of this selfness of his own conscience, all kinds of strange phenomena result. This type of conscience has much to do with the selection of vocation. It has to do with the management of a home. It has to do with the training of children. It has to do with the whole structure of individual and family moralities. Conscience is therefore something that justifies an attitude which we have already decided to accept. A conscience then is what we feel at our present state of growth in the reaction to the circumstances of our environment. Conscience is therefore to be found behind nearly everything from Adolf Hitler to St. Francis of Assisi. It is always what we believe, what we think, what we feel we should do under a certain condition. Actually, of course, this type of conscience is subject to growth. A conscience based entirely upon our own personal complex is therefore subject to modification and renovation. A change of attitude will therefore give us a new level of conscience. The individual who outgrows certain areas of selfishness finds his conscience now applauds unselfishness. The individual who has been a kind of Robin Hood, who has been a kind of defender of the people and may have achieved this defense through ulterior motives and violence, will gradually be modified and recognize that his intention to be helpful must be supported by a constructive method of achieving the help he wishes to spread around among others. So here we have a psychological approach to it, and this we do encounter very frequently in working with people. One of the interesting things that this type of conscience brings into focus is a conflict within the person himself. There appear then to be two levels of conscience arising from a separation uh, due to personality pressures. 
A simple example of this is the individual who says, I know I should and I do believe in forgiving my enemies, but don't ask me to forgive Mr. Jones. This is different. The mind then builds in a strong case as to why we should not forgive Mr. Jones. And this case gradually converts us so that we may go out and tell others to forgive their enemies, but we must not be expected to forgive ours, because this is all different. Our own case is unique, curiously just, and against the pressure of non-forgiveness, we have no adequate uh, resistance. After a time, perhaps, when we have experienced the misfortunes and tragedies of unforgiveness, we may finally come to the point where we decide to forgive our enemy, to get it over with and try to reconcile. This period of reconciliation seemingly comes nearly always as more solutional than the continuance of the grievance. Therefore, we find a certain peace or a certain release when we get over negative or destructive attitudes. But for many persons, this type of release is very, very difficult to attain because of the tremendous emphasis upon self. This brings the ego, or the personal self, into focus as a factor in conscience. The individual has his own personal integration. He is a self-centered human being. To him, the most important thing in the world is himself. That he shall achieve the fulfillment of his own purposes becomes the major reason for life. While this remains, conscience is defeated, and yet in its place is a pseudo-conscience which justifies all and makes all these ambitions uh, perfectly proper. The case in point, perhaps, is a certain man who in a very dishonorable, vicious manner accumulated a huge fortune. After he had accumulated it, he began to realize the penalty that he had to pay in order to gain what he had. Little by little, this pressure of what he has becomes too heavy a burden, and there is a change in his own internal life. This individual, in later years, may give away his fortune or devote it entirely to benevolent purposes. He wishes to get rid of the conscience hurt that has developed as a result of his previous conduct. Usually only experience, time, and suffering will bring about this type of reformation. But it does arise when the individual discovers the negative consequences of the negative causes which he himself set in motion. Under this type of pressure, we find sometimes that the worst sinner becomes the greater saint. Because finally we can no longer endure the conflicts set up by the consequences of conduct that was basically dishonest in the first place. This type of conscience problem has resulted in numerous benevolences in which the individual seeks to uh, restore his own comfort of inner life by various humanitarian acts and philanthropies uh, which will compensate for his personal selfishness. Selfishness and self-centeredness, of course, a block conscience always. The Greeks pointed this out very clearly, that the soul has very little opportunity to express itself as long as the strength of the ego remains unbridled or unrestricted. The ego in the individual is based upon the simple fact, I want what I want. Also, it is there to justify getting what we want. And if someone questions this, as being a proper way of growth, the individual will then point out that everyone else is doing it that way, and therefore he shall continue. In other words, he uses the delinquency of society to justify his own personal compromise of principles. Locked in this self-centeredness, therefore, as long as the individual is concerned primarily only with the satisfaction of his own ambitions, he can never actually obey or receive the inspiration of inner conscience or consciousness. 
Now, another phase of this subject comes in with the, the doctrine of the human soul. Uh, most ancient peoples believed that spirit and matter are bound together by a psychic factor in all living creatures. This psychic factor is a blending of the divine and the material. It forms the bridge between the natural man and the man of God. It becomes the link by which heaven and earth are bound together in a benevolent conspiracy. The soul, therefore, in man is variously discussed. To some, the soul is a kind of new entity that is born in man, but never dies. It is the immortal mortal. It has a beginning, but no end. And this in itself is scientifically difficult to explain, and scientists have given it up. But it is still true that in terms of some theologies at least, soul is referred to as a one-ended stick. It is something that begins but does not end. In Christian mysticism, the soul represents a kind of psychic body. It is the body of Christ in man. It is the embodiment of the Christ principle of redemption within the nature of the mortal being. The soul is therefore constantly seeking the growth of the person. And in the problem of evolution with man, there comes a t time of transition in which the leadership of man himself, his own leadership over his life, must be transferred from the mind to the soul. To most mystics, the soul has been seated in the heart. And in most oriental religions, the soul seeking is called the heart doctrine. It is the gradual victory of a superior power beyond man's formal, physical, material integration. The soul is something that lives and grows and exists within the individual. The soul is nourished according to the virtues of life. The soul grows when all positive elements of experience are built into it. The soul becomes a measuring stick. It becomes a kind of thermometer which tells the condition of the total being. The soul in the Christian mysticism is often referred to as the golden wedding garment, which man must wear when he goes to the bride of the, to the marriage of the Lamb. The soul is therefore something that is another kind of body, which is built out of character and conduct, that unfolds through ages, that passes from one embodiment to another, and is constantly unfolding. It is Emerson's oversoul. It is this mysterious power that grows upon the beauties and virtues of life. It is based upon man's gradual ex unfolding experience of the importance and significance of good in his own career. The soul has been assumed to be the seat of the arts, even as the mind has been of the sciences. And all material things finally come under the, the dominion of the soul power that is locked within them. Now there is a belief which is all long held that the soul was once more powerful in man than it is today. Its power residing in the fact that the soul became more and more limited as the mental nature de developed greater and greater individuality. The soul is not nearly as individual as the mind. The, the soul is a collective. The soul is a communal thing, whereas the mind is very highly objective and very highly personal. The Greeks held that the soul had to be helped. The soul is a kind of spiritual infant, born in the manger of man's physical body, surrounded by the beasts which are his animal appetites and instincts. And this soul must be nurtured. It must be guided. It must be released. Man cannot actually add to the soul as a principle. What he calls helping the soul to grow really means helping the release of the soul power through the various vehicles of the personality. Growth is therefore for the soul release 
unfoldment, the gradual coming forth of that which is better through the instrumentality of human effort and dedication. The dedication to the soul becomes the power which gives it nutriment. The soul is fed by the virtues of humanity. Each individual feeds the soul by his own dedications, by his allegiances to principles, by his recognition of the unity of life, the beauty of living, and all of the related matters. The soul rejoices in great art, great music, and most of all, it rejoices in great virtues. It also comes just as easily and just as immediately to the most simple person, for it is simply the gradual release of the best part of himself through the rest of himself. The soul is a link, then, between an individual with his personal attitudes and the universal principle from which he is suspended. It is the effulgent blossom with its roots in heaven. It is the rose of the West mystic, and it is the lotus of the East. It is the symbol of the release of that part of man which is the best part of himself. But it is built gradually over a long period of time by the gradual accumulation of constructive achievement. It is enriched, it is renobled, it is released into expression by the effort of the individual to grow. He is not actually bestowing something upon the soul any more than food actually creates the body. But food maintains the body, and good maintains the soul, giving it ever greater expression and greater spheres of manifestation. The release of the soul was therefore the great work of antiquity and of alchemy. It was the gradual regeneration of the individual from within himself, only possible because there was within himself forever and always the seed of his own regeneration. This concept is gaining uh, greater popularity today also, especially as we begin to recognize the fallibility of the mind upon which we have based so many of our conclusions. That the mind by itself is suitable of achieving the ends we desire is now regarded as uh, unlikely. It is not being justified by any experience that we have. Now, the idea of the world soul is involved also in the great triads of universal religion. In the Platonic and Socratic school, we find the great trinity of divine power described as the one, the beautiful, and the good. The one represents the spirit or divine power locked within man. The good is the representation of conduct, morality, action the performing of those deeds which are good. And between the one and the good is the beautiful. And the beautiful was the second person of the ancient triad and is the messianic principle in Christianity. The beautiful is represented under the term of love. It is the glorification of all that is constructive, idealistic, and noble in the composition of man. It is the release through man of the God-man within himself. It is the release through the personality of the psychic center of adoration and veneration which is natural to all created things. The soul, therefore, becomes, in a sense, the individual savior of each person in whom that soul has residence. This redemption from within was the essential principle of, do of the doctrines of Bemi, the German mystic. For to him the soul was like a little seed planted in the heart, uh, which would grow into a great tree, and the branches of which were the medicines for the healing of the nations. The soul is something that is a kind of second birth, for the body is born from the womb and the soul is born from the heart, says the German mystic. And this is very largely the basis of conscience. Conscience is actually, to the mystic, the divine soul in himself revealing itself and impelling him to conduct consistent with its own nature. The sorrowing soul 
is the soul that is afflicted by the wounds of materiality. Uh, this is the part of the symbol in the early Christian church of the Mata Dolorosa, the mother of God with the seven wounds, the seven wounds being the seven deadly sins. Therefore, the soul is wounded by the evil that is done by the person. The soul is afflicted by the burden of destructiveness which arises in the personality. The soul is constantly counseling uh, for the recognition of those virtues and those values which bring peace and happiness to the individual. So as we come on down now to the personal conduct of people and the problems and the difficulties with which we are all faced every day, we know that growth is the gradual victory of soul power over brute force. The soul is the leader which takes command when the mind recognizes its inadequacy. When we leave this life in the hands of the mind, we are in trouble. On the other hand, the mind, once it has been redeemed by the soul power, is regenerated and becomes the most powerful instrument for good that is possible for man to use. The uh, conversion of the individual uh, is really a threefold process. First, the body must be converted to the rules of common sense and integrity and its needs met. The heart must be converted away from its personal passions to an impersonal compassion for all that lives. And the mind must be converted so that it is no longer the instrument for the gratification of self-seeking, but becomes what it was intended to be, the instrument for the instruction of the whole world and the instruction of the mind, the sharing of the knowledge of the soul. The soul is therefore uh, the ruler of the mind. And when this rulership is compromised or denied, the life begins to drift into problems. If you have been brought up in the average Western home in the last century, you will realize that the conduct of modern man is showing serious deteriorations. And this means that the conscience, the collective conscience of the public has been gradually blocked by negative factors. A quarrel in his book of emblems, which we know are unfavorable. We try to live a little closer to conscience. We try to recognize the fact that when we say with our lips that a certain change is necessary to us, then it is high time for us to vitalize our words and begin to live according to this higher level of belief or conviction. A common occurrence of this today is alcoholism. The average alcoholic does not want to be an alcoholic. He wants whatever he believes to be the temporary benefits of intoxication, but he does not want to destroy his mind. He does not wish to inflict upon his body a situation that will give him years of physical pain. He would like to get over it, but the habit is hard to break. Some have found release through Alcoholics Anonymous. Others have taken the situation in hand personally and corrected the condition. But when they did so, this was a victory of soul power over brute force. It was a victory of the inner life over the habits of the body and the mental emotional complex. The individual who has been leaning upon some artificial stimulant or relaxing factor, when he begins to depend upon himself and is no longer dependent upon these false values, he is also confronted with another problem, namely, is his own self sufficiently dependable? Can he really back up his desire to improvement by taking the course that may bring some temporary discomfort or inconvenience? Is he strong enough to break a bad habit and uh, survive the changes that this breakage will cause in his life pattern? This is something that, again, is becoming a very definite issue. 
Another one, of course, a very, very definite one, is the spread of various narcotic, uh, narcotic addictions among young people. Most young people today are aware of the tragedies of various hard drugs, but they are not able to escape the pressure of the peer group, and they're not able uh, to break the habit once it has moved in upon them. They do not have the experience in life, they do not have the personal strength, and in most cases they do not have the family strength to assist them to make this correction. So the problem remains one which they would have to begin at least to work out within themselves through a private, quiet dedication of conduct to what is known inwardly to be true. This knowing inwardly that there is something better than what they are doing is a voice of conscience. It is something that tells them that it is not necessary for them to be weak. But in order not to be weak, they must become strong. They must take hold of their personal lives. If they do not take hold of these lives, they will gradually fall into the common failings, ailments, and tragedies of their times. Now, in many character problems, we have the same situation. Wherever the individual can honestly say to himself that he is not doing what is best for him, conscience is telling him something. Conscience is warning him. Consciousness, conscience is trying to inspire him to make the necessary temperamental and personality changes. The most da dangerous and important of these reformational processes is to gain some form of control over attitudes. Attitudes simply are very difficult for the individual to find solutions for. We have all kinds of attitudes that are simply not good. Nature, and involving soul power and conscience, very often helps gradually to get over attitudes that otherwise would be crippling. The individual who is under sudden grief, for example, may for a time be badly disoriented, but in the course of some months or a year or two, nature begins to heal this. And unless the person centers and intensifies the neurosis, he will gradually recover. There are other attitudes, however, which become more fixed with years. And these are attitudes of temperament or disposition which have been nursed perhaps since childhood. Therefore, the beginning of the release of the soul is through obedience to conscience. And if this conscience, when it does come through, does not invite in the right direction, then what we are suffering from is not a wrong conscience, but an inability to break through a personality pattern. Very often what we call conscience is nothing but attitude. And if the conscience impels us to do that which is not beautiful, not good, not essentially progressive for ourselves, then it is not conscience at all. There is no such a thing, really, as a bad conscience. It is a conscience burdened with the sins of the flesh. This means that we cannot always depend upon the inside. We do not know where inside pressures come from. Some of them may be of God, but some of them are merely pressures of our own ego, our own personal attitudes, trying to force themselves into a dominant position. Attitudes trying to become dictators of careers. And where this sets in, we also have to have the wisdom to note the false doctrine that is being forced upon us by our own selfishness and self-interest. Wherever we find lives that are not interesting, not useful, not constructive, not busily engaged in some worthy purpose. We find lives that have more or less fallen victim to self-centeredness. The individual who has no way, as far as he can imagine, of doing good is simply one who has measured good in the terms of his own attitudes alone and not in terms of the things that need doing. The, the, age or the older group, or the more aged people, have some more of this problem to consider. When they retire from some active occupation, which has acted as a general guide and rule, they fall back upon themselves. 
and sometimes when they fall back upon or into themselves, they fall into a vacuum. They fall into a condition in which there is no longer any particular incentives to do anything. These people, maybe with 10 or 15 years of good life ahead of them, simply depend into an inertia. They do nothing but waste time. They try to find something to do to fill the days that they are going to be here under Social Security. They are trying to get out of this world slowly but painlessly. And, of course, the problem is such that they usually fail in both cases. The individual who has time must recognize that life is a commitment to usefulness. Every individual who is not bound by some labor over which he has no control must place himself under the control of a constructive purpose. If he does not do this, he will not grow. If he does not grow, he will face the future with a poor hope. He will also carry away from this world less of good than he should. This life should be a, an experience which we take with us, in which we are glad, in substance, that we have been given the opportunity to grow. But there is nothing more tragic than to be given an opportunity and waste it. So older persons on retirement patterns should find things to do that mean something. They can always, in these days of great stress and trial, find useful outlets of some kind. They can assist those who are more uh, unhappy than themselves. They can share whatever they have of insight and understanding with those in need. They can help disillusioned persons to realize that there are good people around them, even though they have not previously known many of them. Everywhere, growth is the answer to the problem. And growth means two things, that we shall change for the better inside, and having changed, shall use the new insights to control outer conduct, so that it becomes more beneficial both to ourselves and to others. Failure to do this is a waste of life, and nature penalizes a waste of this kind. Actually, then, you can begin to nourish the soul, as many people could do, by turning in older years to various arts by means of which beauty and the insight to recognize universal law and order become better disciplined. The love of the beautiful, through music, through painting, uh, through folk arts and crafts, uh, through all kinds of studies of natural things for the, to find their beneficial value to others and having attained some such knowledge, sharing it with those whom we know need it. This type of career uh, helps to feed the soul for the soul rejoices in its own quality and its own qualities are particularly its charity and compassion. We can do the same thing with our attitudes. We can reach the point, perhaps, that Will Rogers said he reached, but he never met a man to whom he couldn't be a friend. And this, is, uh, this kind of concept uh, can be carried into personal living. We can gradually penetrate the differences that separate us and find in every living thing the same spiritual soul germ that we have within ourselves. We can gradually uh, regain our own uh, equilibrium in a world of unbalanced factors. We can develop a new understanding of religion. We can find how to meet and work with people of other faiths pleasantly, comfortably, happily, joyfully. We can begin to understand the great systems of thought that have helped to advance the world. And wherever we learn a new idea, we must apply it to our own conduct. If we have a, ma a mental extension, it should result in a material improvement in our orientation. And uh, wherever we have leisure, wherever we have opportunity, we should carefully guard and censor our conduct under these new insights that have come to us. This is also a very valuable factor 
in improving the general condition of the world around us. If we do not support corruption, we will not have so much of it. If we find our, most, our television screen is not giving us what we want, we can turn it off. And in so doing, if enough persons do this, the changes will occur that we want. We can do the same thing with every expenditure. We can stop being wasteful. We can be more wise. We can control our own appetites. We can keep out of debt. We can make various adjustments in which our own personal improvement becomes a unit in social improvement. And as more and more persons awake to these realizations, the world itself improves. And as the world gets better, the voice of conscience in each of us will get stronger and be more available for the improvement of our environment. We can stop wasting. We can stop deceiving. We can keep the speed limit. We can do all kinds of things which do not really interfere with our social life in any major manner, but which will indicate that by degrees we are overcoming that instinct of chisel that is inside of so many of us. We will begin to think in terms of honesty, of weights and measures, and all these things will rest as a crown of peace upon the conscience. For the conscience wants these things. The conscience is there to give us advice in time of trouble. In the old doctrines and philosophies, conscience was an elder, a kindly old counselor, a sort of paternal grandfather, the voice of long ages of experience, given out and turned and transformed into the simple needs of coming generations. As children once gathered around their grandparents to hear the stories of old times, so the conscience within us is a, a, an eternal teacher. It is something that is constantly giving us the benefit of all of the living of time, all of the past and all of the days that have gone by, and also inspiring us to live better today and to build a better future for us all. If we listen to this, if we really allow it to speak, it will give us not only a clearer insight of what to do next, but will help to give us the strength to do what is next. This is another very serious problem, namely that the average individual wants to grow but does not know how. He does not know what steps he should take. He does not know how he should begin to improve himself. Education should have taught him this long ago, but it didn't do it. Religion should have taught it to him. It did in a way but it never gave him the vital impulse to accomplish now those things which are most immediately necessary. Because of this, and because of the fact that environment is doing very little for us and much to us, we are in doubt as to how to start to grow. If we want to listen to conscience, if we want to follow it, how do we proceed? If conscience is really a step ahead of us, which is usually the case, how do we take that step? I think the answer to that becomes more or less obvious in the way in which conscience operates in the individual. Conscience usually steps in at a moment when the individual is under temptation to be less than himself. Conscience comes in as a result of repentance over an action which we know we should not have committed. A conscience may tell, uh, point out that we have said an unkind word when a kind one would have been more useful. Conscience tells us that we shouldn't have tried to get more than we were entitled to in some transaction. A conscience may tell us that when the wholesale price goes up five cents, we are not entitled to raise the price of the article by five dollars. These things we know. And if we're quiet for a moment, we realize this. But as a... a uh, conscience farm, we take another drink and keep on. Actually, when this voice of conscience begins to speak, all we really have to do is listen. And when it says to us, uh-uh, you shouldn't have done that, then we should try de definitely to understand why we shouldn't have done it, and if possible, to undo the thing that we did that was wrong, and to remember the next time. But once you do a favor for conscience, you do something it wants you to do, 
it is more available on the next occasion. Having some more confidence in you, your conscience begins to be more active. And it will warn you beforehand uh, what is likely uh, to be the consequences of a mistaken action. The Pythagoreans had a, an exercise for this. At the end of each day, they went over the day and estimated it. They sat in judgment upon their own conduct. They remembered in detail for how they met a situation. And if a meeting of that situation was obviously not good, they studied it, thought about it, and tried to decide what they should have done instead. By following this rule every day over a period of time, they gradually anticipated their mistakes and were able to rectify them before they actually occurred. They began to realize the attitudes which were peculiarly negative, or the temptations which they as individuals had the greatest difficulty in resisting. In one person it might be one temptation, and in another person a different temptation. But each in retrospection found out his own problem, and also the consequences. And the consequences uh, usually were sufficiently clear to form a basic documentation for a better understanding of the situations. Thus, by retrospection, we find out how much better we could have done something, how we could have prevented an antagonism from arising, how we could have forgiven a slight insult or a slight by a deeper understanding, and where it became obvious that a chilliness was developing within the structure of the family, how we could prevent this from getting worse and how, in all probabilities, we could correct it. By retrospection, therefore, the individual finds out how much better he could have been than he was. And this discovery is usually quite valuable. Also in the ter term of soul power, there is a certain contentment that comes in as an interesting factor. It has been said that man was not born to be happy, but he was capable of contentment. Happiness is a very large term. For most persons, it involves considerable extravagance, and in a great many instances, compromise the principles. But contentment is a state of inner peace. It is the individual who lives without regret, an individual who has found in simple things that which is necessary for his contentment. Contentment is the recognition that he is doing what he is supposed to do at this particular moment, that he is living within a pattern of common sense, that he has reasonable control of appetites and emotions and attitudes, and that he can go to bed each night and rest well because he knows he has lived the day in a reasonably constructive manner. Comfort is important, of course, but in comparison to this problem, of living in a conformable manner with principles and ideals. This is what we might term the nearest approach to basic happiness that we can know. Contentment is to be in harmony with the purposes of the soul. And this harmony means in harmonious relationship with conscience. There is nothing that we are doing that conscience says is not right. In this way, we can live in a very comfortable way, manner within ourselves. We cannot strive for the great and exorbitant satisfaction that we think to be necessary. We can be satisfied to live in a manner which gives us internal peace. Actual obedience to conscience is the source of internal peace. There is no longer any contradictory process working in us. We believe a certain thing, and that which we believe, we do. And if we find an ex if by experience that our belief was not good, we are not ashamed to change it. We do not have to be consistent with our previous attitude. We simply have to be right. And when we are right, we are comfortable. And when we are comfortable, we are contented. And the processes of growth within ourselves are advanced. 
where we break faith with our principles and are not contented, where we are no longer in a comfortable internal state, uh, it is now becoming increasingly obvious in the world of science that our conflicts with conscience are a contributing factor to many ailments. The physical body does not flourish under conflict. The physical body is not happy when the individual must live in a state of continual remorse over his own misdeeds. The body does not flourish under excesses of any kind. The digestive system wants you to be a contented human could be. And when discontent comes in, dyspepsia comes in with it. When the individual no longer fulfills the simple impulses of his normal conscience, the high blood pressure comes along. Then comes all kinds of medications, most of which are intended to block symptoms, the cause of which does do not lie the cause of which does not lie in the body but in the psychic integration behind the body so wherever there are uh, efforts or trials to go against uh, the normal the constant the rightfulness the peace the integrity of living the body begins to suffer now no one really enjoys suffering they do not like pain they would prefer not to have it. And one of the ways to reduce it markedly is to reduce stress. And stress is nearly always the effort of the person to bluff his way through something that is not right. Stress is a desperate determination to fulfill willfulness. And it is, as the old Zohar says, it is from will, from will that evil fell. The, uh, the self-will is the source, in most cases, of corruption and discord. So as long as this self-will forces us to do things that are not as they should be done, we're going to be sick. And sickness, in turn, gradually becomes chronic with the habits that cause it. And while there's no possible way of saying that we can overcome all illness at the present time, or that we can be, live indefinitely in a corporeal body that wears out. It is perfectly possible to say that the suit of clothes we have on now is going to fit better and wear longer if we take care of the attitudes of the person in it. If we take care of the problems of our own conduct, uh, we will have this body in a better shape longer than we would otherwise. It is our own abuses and misuses. But it's not just simply that we stand in the draft and get a cold. What we are really suffering from mostly is not a draft. It is a pressure from within the ego. It is this tremendous determination to do what we please in a universe in which the law says we must do as we should. And the conflict between self-will and the divine will goes on until man obeys. And what he must obey, and how he must obey, and when and where he must obey, are available to him in the form of the answers given by conscience. Conscience can lead him out of most of the flower of the spawn, which is mentioned in Pilgrim's Progress, and lead him into a contentment, an adjustment, a consistent relationship with life that is useful and purposeful. If he has mistaken submerged desires for conscience, he'll find out, because these submerged desires will not cure the problem. But where he keeps faith with the principles of life, where he is true to the grand plan of which he is a part, he will have a minimum of stress and a maximum of contentment. In fact, he may so be so contented before he gets through with it that he'll actually decide that he is happy. The happiness of the uh, Arabian night tells us, must be earned. And the individual earns happiness by deserving it. And in order to deserve it, he must realize that happiness is not the fulfillment of desire. It is the correction of the impulse of desire within himself. If he desires only that which is good, desire becomes the basis of happiness or contentment.
If he desires that which is not good, he can work himself to death, he can have one coronary after another, and he still will never achieve what he calls happiness. So happiness is a byproduct of doing what is next, and doing it in the best possible way that we can. The only real instructor in this thing, the most intimate of all instructors, is this inner voice within ourselves. It sometimes gets tired, and you may not hear from it for a while. It gets worn out by being constantly blocked. It is even seriously offended by being ignored forever. But if you give it an opportunity, it will continue to work joyously to help the person to get over the little problem that he faces every minute. The individual was watching his favorite television program and was in the midst of the ninth murder when the phone rang. He went to the phone, irritated because it was taking him away from a large dose of mayhem. He therefore was short on the phone, turned off the friend who phoned, and told them to call some other time when they weren't so busy. In other words, busy watching murder. This was a mistake. He should have recognized the telephone call as a deliverance, as an opportunity to find some way or reason to break away from that type of problem. He should have been gracious and thoughtful and kind, and he should never have allowed his interest of this nature to offend someone else, but he might well do it. Therefore, if his conscience had been leading him, he would have been at least kindly and realize that even if he missed his favorite murder, it would probably be repeated 50 times in the next 30 days. <laughs> Taking a different attitude, there are no interruptions. What is an interruption is a breather. If it's an interruption we don't like, we're unhappy about it. But whatever it is, it is also an opportunity for the individual to express a better part of himself, to be selfless, to be more thoughtful, to be more kind, never to be rude or crude in relationships simply because he's busy pleasing himself. Gradually, conscious.